Part One, Chapter Twenty One of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One: Theology During the Early Period. On the fundamental Christian doctrines, there was a general agreement among Christians, both East and West, even before the first formula of truth was established, namely by the Council of Nicaea eighty three hundred twenty five there was a bold discussion of great themes the daring of those first heroes for the truth is astounding with only a brief history and writhing in the agonies of martyrdom they nevertheless wrote on themes of the broadest character there was a difference between the greek and the roman christian the greek was speculative he caught up the terminology of aristotle and the rest and thrust it boldly into his argument on the eternal generation of our lord there was no subject on which he did not enter with boundless enthusiasm the roman was more careful he had less to say but more to do he went beyond his pile of manuscripts and thought of a stronger organization of the church a firmer body of believers a more solid christian phalanx for the conquest of the world but beneath the speculation of the greek and the practical aggressiveness of the roman there was one faith with all the differences in the schools there was but little difference in the ruling theology the divine character lay at the foundation of all doctrine here the christian mind came into severest antagonism to the greek polytheism and the oriental dualism the christian believer regarded god as creator and preserver of the universe no attribute in modern evangelical theology was denied him in the patristic period only when the christians began to consider the relations of the three persons in the godhead and god's revelation of himself to the world do we observe variety but even here there was essential unity tertullian varied from the general view in supposing god must have a body this he did because of the misfortune of his philosophy which was borrowed from paganism that corporeity is a necessity of all existence origen and the school of alexandria controlled the church in avoiding all corporeal representations of deity the whole patristic church said we accept the divine character we do not need to prove it its proof is in us and beyond us arnobius said to attempt to prove god's existence is not much better than to deny it origen clement of alexandria and athanasius agreed in saying that the only possible knowledge we can have of god is based on grace and the logos the methods of proving the unity and trinity of the godhead were not fortunate instead of adhering to the language of the scriptures the theologians made use as well of the dialectics of aristotle and of the example of the elder faiths of india and of persia to show a parallelism yet there was no compromise no disposition to reduce the christian doctrine to the plane of any other faith the term triad was first used by theophilus of antioch while tertullian was the first to introduce the word trinity into christian theology while all the fathers accepted the three persons there was a difference of opinion in regard to the equality of essence justin's view expressed however the general and final belief of the church the three persons exist they are of equal quality beneath all the variety in the universe there is a unity of operation by the one god christology was the most fully developed of all departments of theology the logos of alexandria became the logos of the christian world some teachers proved the incarnation of our lord by a process of necessity that to reveal is a divine necessity just as the gem must shine but this was a low plane of logic the prevailing method was god is all loving and all wise and he willed the salvation of man and by the only means possible god's nature is to bless he is not an introspective character his goodness is operative when it is needed it was the father's good pleasure to reveal himself his will absorbed all necessity 
our lord was generated by the holy ghost born of the virgin mary and led a human life this life was sinless justin theophilus of antioch tatian and the pseudo ignatius held that the son existed from all eternity co-equally with the father but that before creation he proceeded from the father and began to lead a separate personal existence irenaeus taught christ's separate and personal sonship with the father tertullian that the members of the trinity were of the same substance but constitute a succession and origen that the logos was of eternal generation the differences of view were sought to be settled by the council of nicaea a d 325 the christian thinkers had been in danger on the one hand of emphasizing the humanity of our lord to the detriment of his divinity and on the other of allowing his divinity to absorb his humanity but the perfection of each nature finally entered into the permanent faith of the church the final christology of the period reduces itself to this christ was eternally coexistent and cooperative with the father he permitted the full penalty of sin to be visited upon himself his death was voluntary and achieved our redemption he rose from the dead ascended into heaven became our high priest in the fullness of time he will come to judge the world when he will reward the righteous and punish the guilty the discussions on the logos threw the consideration of the holy ghost into the background the adversaries of christianity knew that christianity must stand or fall with the divinity of christ there was no emphatic and general discussion of the doctrine of the holy ghost before the fourth century the views concerning the holy ghost were quite vague by some he was identified with the word and by others with wisdom tertullian was the first to distinctly assert the personality of the spirit though he subordinated him to the father and the son origen followed him in this but was undecided as to his nature the general council of constantinople a d three eighty one formally laid down the doctrine of the divinity of the holy ghost which has ever since been maintained by the church cosmology was a fruitful field of speculation is matter eternal was a question which persia had hurled at the western mind and because christianity answered no the whole oriental philosophy opposed the new religion the christian claimed that his sacred books taught that only an eternal god could create matter tertullian spoke for the whole church when he said that god did not need the world for his own glory but that creation was for man the pagan believed in a past golden age the christian looked back upon lost paradise but his eye was keen to foresee a perfect restoration he studied man in relation to the future sin passed from our first parents upon all humanity theophilus of antioch and tertullian taught that man can arrive at spiritual excellence by the development of his spiritual faculties through his own choice and the quickening power of the spirit three views on the union of soul and body were advocated one pre-existence of the soul before union with the body two the soul is transmitted through adam to all generations three each soul is created with the body at birth each of these three views had its advocates but the third became the prevailing opinion the world's social life is impure against this stands the church organized purity god's children his bride the foreshadowing of his everlasting kingdom it is a living body of believers there may be unbelievers in the body but in the main the church is pure and god will take care to preserve its character the object of the church is the culture of the soul until released from its bondage it is the depository of the divine truth god has furnished in the church according to cyprian and irenaeus the universal operation of the spirit there was a disposition on the part of some teachers to associate a sacrificial union of the holy ghost with the water in baptism 
Origen says that baptism is the beginning and the source of the gifts of the Spirit. Baptismal regeneration was thus taught by many of both the early and later fathers. Gregory of Nazianzus called baptism the sacrament of the new birth. Cyprian spoke of the regenerating water, and Augustine of the sacrament of birth and regeneration. The Greeks were much inclined to emphasize the spiritual gifts, while the Latins were more cautious, and attached great importance to the previous spiritual state of the baptized. In the general faith of the church, there was not only a belief in baptismal regeneration, but a disposition to assign to baptism an effect so important that it became the custom to postpone its reception till the close of life, for fear of losing its precious effect. Some writers emphasized the ethical disposition of the soul, but the universal tendency was to exaggerate the effect of the baptismal waters. The act of baptism, in the adult, was the human sign of a divine act of grace performed upon the soul. Tertullian disapproved of infant baptism, Origen favored it, and described it as an existing usage. Cyprian, speaking for the Western Church, did the same. The usage was universally acknowledged by the middle of the third century. The Lord's Supper was the human sign, divinely appointed to keep in mind the death of Christ. Ordinary bread and wine mixed with water were employed as symbols. After the second century, none but baptized persons could partake of the Lord's Supper. During the patristic period, there are occasional traces of the doctrine of transubstantiation, as in a theory stated by the fertile Irenaeus, that the elements, under consecration, have the effective power of the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation seems to have been taught in the highly rhetorical language of Ambrose, Chrysostom, and others, and to have had considerable advocacy in private circles. But many of the fathers made more or less distinction between the sign and the thing signified. The words, this is my body, were sometimes construed as a liturgical accommodation, meaning the representation of the body and blood by the bread and wine, and not literally a substantial transformation. The church loved to think of a peaceful and happy future. The early coming of Christ was expected by many, while some of the more serious teachers and scholars thought they saw in the New Testament abundant warrant for the speedy introduction of the millennium. But all such hopes were soon eclipsed in the Christian mind by the broad and white harvest field to be reaped before his coming. In the Alexandrian theology, we find the first traces of a purgatorial fire. Origen made the final fire, which should destroy the world, as the same fire which should purify all souls. During the first three centuries, the general church believed that all who die enter an intermediate state, but after the fourth century, the opinion prevailed that the wicked abide in Hades, waiting for the final deliverance, and that the disciplinary dealing will cleanse them from all impurities, while the righteous will immediately enter into the presence of God. The present life was regarded as the only probationary possibility. The final restoration of the wicked was advocated by Origen, who even admitted the devil to its benefits. But here, as in other fields, the church was slow to be guided by the warm fancy and generous sympathy of the imaginative African. The process of theological adjustment was slow, and attended with great difficulty. The differences in race, climate, and intelligence were serious, and, before a theological consensus was arrived at, there was the appearance of hopeless diversity. This diversity continued long after the Council of Nicaea. One council would establish Arianism, another would overthrow it. But the Council of Nicaea had the great effect of placing the doctrine of the divinity of Christ beyond doubt as a fundamental doctrine, and of teaching the Church that there was to be a written standard of universal faith determined by the Church in its representative capacity that the doctrines of the church would not be left to the temporary triumph 
of some acute dialectician that an emperor could not make and ordain a christian creed with any hope of success and that theology is not a stagnant science which admits of no enlargement with the flight of centuries and with the growth of the general domain of knowledge it is not likely that notwithstanding the controversies on theological questions the faith of the christians was seriously agitated the hair-splitting sophistries of christian debaters who had brought their pagan dialectics with them into the christian fold did not disturb the average christian those men had little to do with the determination of doctrine the general body of plotting and fervent members who knew no logic but the facts of the gospels were the principal agents who kept the church close to its original moorings although the most abstruse doctrines were discussed with great intensity among the people the mass of the faithful remained true to the orthodox church the theology of the matter-of-fact believer was exact and closely knit he was not disconcerted by the jargon on the process of the logos towards manifestation or the procession of the holy ghost also from the sun or whether only the wicked enter hades he knew that jesus was born in bethlehem that the holy ghost was the divine comforter and that the believer's lord would not inflict on him a long suspense after martyrdom before permitting him to behold his face the nicene conclusions far from being the mere fruit of theologians were the faith of the great commonwealth of believers throughout christendom the real master at nicaea was neither athanasius nor constantine but the humble believer who might be keeping his flocks beside the euphrates or cultivating his patch of lentils in the thebaid or singing his psalms beneath his thatched roof on the outskirt of a dark forest of the germania of trajan's day End of chapter twenty one